Katz. What's up, Doc? It's Dr. Christian Jessen. From Friday Night Dinner, it's Tom Rosenthal. And their team captain, John Richardson. And facing them tonight, Northern Soul, it's Sarah Milliken. Wakey, wakey, it's Lorraine Kelly. And their team captain, John Locke. Now, welcome your host, Jimmy. Welcome to 8 Out of 10 Cats, a show about opinion polls, surveys and statistics. Did you know, for example, 25% of men think their eyes are their best feature? Let me think. Buns, guns, pecs, nads, little Jimmy Johnson, eyes. Six best. Six. <laughs> the world's oldest goldfish was 42. He put his long life down to regular early morning swims. <laughs> and the average life expectancy in the UK is 80 years. Does not include Scotland. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> right, let's get started. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's the name of our first round. Tonight, it's our panellist's job to guess the British public's top three most important moments in life. Sean Seam, what do you think's up there? Uh, what, what do you think? Loose women. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it falling in love? Well, yeah. Go on, when did you first fall in love? Uh, maybe 21. You see, I thought there was the one, because I'd read too many, you know, that kind of books and seen that, that kind of film where there's just one and that's it, and it's rubbish. If you're, you know, watching at home and people in the audience, there's five. There's not one. I've one seen a lot of those every... films and read a lot of those books. <laughs> one for five. every decade. You have one for... So I've done my 20s, I've got a nice one in my 30s, and then he'll have to go soon, cos I'm 36. <laughs> It's lovely, it's a shame. Um, <laughs> 40s, 50s, 60s, and then after that you just have, like, no strings attached sex with whoever's in the same home. <laughs> You're such a romantic, aren't you? <laughs> I am. And Lorraine, when did you first fall in love? Oh, probably about 16. 16? Yeah, Brian yeah. Kennedy. I can't tell you any more than that, but it was lovely. It was Why really can't you tell good. us any more? Because... Because is he dead? I don't want to embarrass. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think first love is really important, and you can really not underestimate it because yeah. it's it's really exciting, and because it's all new, and you've never been there before, and I cannot it's fabulous. Wait. Are you remembering it all? <laughs> <laughs> Sean, you never really talk about your you softer side know. and being in love, mm. and I think I speak on behalf of everyone. But I'd like to just. I just see a bit of the real you. Yes. When did you fall in love, Sean? Well, I always find that the confusing thing about falling in love is the symptoms of falling in love, a sort of light-headedness, giddiness, are very similar to the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm in love or the flu's blocked. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't... I don't know if you're the one, or we need to change flats. We need to have a way with John, have you ever been in love? The first two people I fell in love with... Two? Hedge <laughs> <laughs> your bets. Different occasions, both ended with their partners telling me to stop phoning their home. <laughs> the first one was a clown, uh, who I fell in love with when I was about eight. He opened a shopping centre near me, and I was transfixed. <laughs> this guy could juggle, he could do magic, he had poems. <laughs> Clown and how old were you? Clown must have been in his late twenties, early thirties, <laughs> and maybe nine or ten. <laughs> I asked for a picture. <laughs> He's given me his card. It's only got his phone number on it. <laughs> he obviously wants me to call. <laughs> I left a few messages. Uh, <laughs> and one day when I phoned up, his wife picked up that bitch. This sounds like an implausible story that the clown told the police. Like, no, he was calling me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of you phoning out and going, what are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> I got the big shoes on. <laughs> it wasn't a sexual thing, it was just the love between a child and a clown. <laughs> when did you first fall in love with a woman? Uh, in Torquay, on holiday. <laughs> Took her to see Men in Black. Uh, rained on the way out, give my coat, did the whole thing. Little pity kiss at the end of the week, which, I'll be honest, I may have misread. <laughs> Started phoning. Uh, <laughs> he's not picking up the phone either, little minx. So what I did... 
<laughs> bought one of those school exercise books and across every line of every page I wrote I love and then her name. Uh, if I made a mistake, tore the page out and then I posted it to her. As not creepy, glad that's not creepy. <laughs> symbol of commitment and grammatical accuracy. <laughs> well, let's have a look and see whether first love is one of the most important moments in life. <laughs> most men say that when they fall in love, they can't tell if it's the real thing. I can. I have a special little indicator that sticks up. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Johnstein, what's the other most important moment in life? People do babies, don't they? <laughs> you made it sound like litter. <laughs> I think the only reason I want to have kids is so I can look at other people's without being accused of being a paedophile. <laughs> when you walk past a... <laughs> I don't mean in that word. No, just no, mean... dig yourself out of this. I'd love to see this. <laughs> He's got a shovel, on he's, on, he's on, the, on your marks, John, <laughs> and dig your way out of that one. Sometimes you're walking past a playground. Sure. <laughs> sure. You start, he's, even, he's going deeper before he even starts the dig. <laughs> Sometimes you're walking past a playground and you just want to be able to watch the abandon of children. <laughs> it's, it's like watching nature. It's like when you watch the leaves change in autumn. Sometimes you want to watch a kid on a swing and think, oh, I used to be on swings before I had jobs and before people judged me and before I wasn't allowed to be in a park. And then before, <laughs> before you know it, you've been there half an hour and someone says, oh, which one's yours? You go, I'll go then, fine, I'm not. <laughs> it's a nice, and sometimes you a baby say, will look at you. What you should you. say is I haven't chosen yet. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they look at you, though. Sometimes you're on a train. I and look at you! <laughs> for making it weird, weirdos. <laughs> Sometimes you're on a train and a baby looks at you and smiles, <laughs> just in a way a baby would, and yet yeah. you want, as a, as a woman, if you look over and pull a face, you go, oh, it's the maternal instinct kicking in. She's just communicating with the baby. If I look over and go, <laughs> <laughs> go can yeah, someone get Captain you, Weirdo off the train, please? It, <laughs> it sort of depends on whether or not you've got your cock in your hand. <laughs> Dr. Christian, yeah, um, anyway. is there anything that we can do to get John chemically castrated? <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't got kids. Absolutely no desire to have children whatsoever. Yeah, you can't... They just linger too long and they you do, can't have a they life. They do linger, don't they? Yeah. They go on living is another way to say they yeah, go they, on. <laughs> they linger. Yeah. I mean, if they lasted five years, it'd be perfect, but no. <laughs> I never wanted kids, really. I just wanted one of those big American fridges. No, they're really, really big ones. Yeah. I thought it'd be ridiculous. I get one of those. It's just me and my partner there, and like a lasagna and a lemon rolling around in <laughs> it. I thought I'd better have some kids, fill it out with yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think that I was very maternal until I had my baby. Isn't that a bit late, though? Yeah. That really is. That's fine, isn't it? But then it was fine. No, honestly, but, you know... We yeah, were... but what if it wasn't? You can't put it back in, can you? You can't, can you? No, you can't. But see if you do have every drug under the sun. Don't, if somebody comes at you... Not with whilst heroin, you're pregnant, no, I should confirm. No, 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 but in labour, in labour, have everything. You know these folks that lie on bean bags and they have candles? No. No, 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 no. You want to be numb, as God intended. You want to be numb from the waist down, knowing nothing about it until they give you that, a beautiful baby. That's conception or birth. Uh, well... have <laughs> everything. <laughs> I've never had anything more Scottish than that. Take all the drugs that you can. <laughs> Seriously, all of them. Get all of them. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's like you only had the baby for the high. <laughs> no, but it is really. Honestly, I recommend it's it. It's expensive, though. No, it's it on the NHS. Well, if they've worked out... No, it doesn't cost you anything. It's like the National Health Service. No, no, you're saying having baby? children, no, not... I mean, raising oh, children. Oh, not oh, the yeah. drugs. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know a guy that can get it for a favour. Yeah, to raise the child is something that the average they have for its lifetime is two hundred thousand yeah. pounds, and that's not factoring in daddy's drinking, <laughs> daddy's gambling. It's all worthwhile when they turn thirteen and tell you that they hate you and wish you were dead. <laughs> but then they'll look after I've you. I've fast tracked that. They'll, they'll look after you when you're old. What? When you're old, they'll look after you. All the money that you've paid out, they'll have to. I'm going to use money. the money I save to look after me. <laughs> 
Although I don't have kids, because tragically my girlfriend and I can't have children the way we do it. <laughs> Let's see whether having children is one of the most important moments in life. I have a feeling it will be. Yes, of course. Number one. Yes, having children. Doctors warn women should have a baby by the age of 35 to avoid the risk of being deafened by their ticking biological clock. <laughs> OK, fingers on buzzers. One more thing to get. You never really forget, like, the day I passed my driving test, probably the most significant... Because then you can go anywhere, can't you? Get the motor running. <laughs> I mean, it won't surprise anyone to learn that I received a minor on my driving test for excessive caution. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, ladies. <laughs> really annoyed me. You know you're a fanny when on your driving test the instructor's saying, so when I tap the dashboard, I want you to slow down, but for the rest of the time, can you friggin' strap on a pair? <laughs> and just put your foot down. I think it's, uh, it's a big, big time for, you know, teenagers passing their test. I just think it's a very strange, strange thing that uh, we pick that time in life to give kids the opportunity to drive. You know, it's the most sort of hormonally volatile you can be. So are you, are you emotionally insecure and randomly aggressive? Here, have a machine that can kill yourself and others, you know? Like <laughs> when, when can you apply for your provisional licence? <laughs> <laughs> I do drive a car, mate. I drive a Polo 1.2. It's blue. Yeah, right, take that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I drive a uh, Ford Fiesta. It's Spanish for party. <laughs> <laughs> I feel completely left out. <laughs> Do you drive? I've, I've never passed my driving test. Oh. Oh. I took it once and failed it so appallingly badly, I said, I'm never, ever going to drive again and haven't. I respect you for that. I think if you fail your test three times, you should be banned for at least ten years. Uh, <laughs> People think they have a right to drive, and they're like, well, I'll get there in the end. Well, you're clearly shit at this. <laughs> you have to be told to stop now. Like, I failed six times, but then I passed on the seventh. Well, you're probably still shit. <laughs> Do you drive, sir? Yeah, I passed a second time. Apparently, all the, the safest drivers are those who've passed the second time. But I drove into oncoming traffic in my first one. <laughs> But I didn't on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't teach you everything that you really need to learn no. to drive in the in the in the lessons. Do they? they don't teach you like how to balance all your snacks on the passenger seat. <laughs> open or, the crisps when you're at the services because it's difficult to open them when you're driving along. Yeah, but I can open a bottle between my thighs. <laughs> <laughs> she can. <laughs> really impressive if it's one of those gross bottles. <laughs> Shame I have to for that. I think there should be different levels of tests as well. I think there should be a test that you can drive without the radio on, and then there should be another test where you could drive, looking at a text, making a phone call, chatting to your friends, and then there should be a high-level test where you're so good, you can have a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, learning to drive. Let's have a look and see whether it's one of the most important moments in life. <laughs> yes, learning to drive. The Institute of Driving Instructors recommend taking 44 lessons before you attempt your test, in much the same way that McVitie's recommend you eat a lot of biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of that round, Sean, Sarah and Lorraine have two points. John, Christian and Tom have one. <laughs> so our next round is pick of the polls. John, Christian, Tom, what do you fancy answering on? Be a shame not to have the man who's ill while we have someone who can help him. Uh, yes. Most people would rather diagnose themselves on the internet than visit a doctor. Is that true or false? Dr. I think that is definitely true. Yeah, yeah. Do people come into the surgery now and go, oh, well, I'm I know you're a doctor, but I'm pretty sure I've read about this. I know exactly what it is. They bring printouts. <laughs> Great sheaves of printouts of proof that they've got rare Unga Bunga disease and they know it all well. around. <laughs> and is I get Unga Bunga going around. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I would self diagnose is because if you think you're ill, a doctor's surgery is going to make you iller. Well, you're not going to catch anything surfing around on the internet. So look, I, I still don't understand why doctor surgeries are as the way they are. They? In the way we've evolved, there's still a room where you go, get all the sick people in a small room and leave them there for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing to do but cough and fleg all over everyone. <laughs> yeah, but they've got a yachting magazine for you to protect yourself. <laughs> 
the worst thing is, is doctors diagnosing themselves. Now, I've done it many times. Well, what, how do you mean? What, what have you thought? Well, you I've had? nearly killed myself from appendicitis by ignoring it for a week, <laughs> convincing myself it's just a bit of trap wind. I'll be all right. <laughs> Until I was like, I couldn't walk like this. I had to drag myself to hospital with a galloping peritonitis. So. That's not great. Not great. <laughs> and people still come to see you. Not a good advert for my senses. <laughs> Imagine if it had been trapped to window, the relief after a week. Oh. <laughs> it's worth the gamble there, though, isn't it? Just... <laughs> <laughs> Tom, have you, ever, have you ever looked anything up on the internet when, you, when you've had a, you know, I don't I know, just gone through DVD and stuff. So <laughs> have you, have you looked things up? Strange things happen to my body. I, I'd definitely self-diagnose if I had the choice, cos... It would scare me if I did come to you, sir, oh, come and I had something exciting. You just stick it on the telly for everyone to look at. <laughs> do you now? Do you now see? A, you now meet patients, and you look at it, and you go, "Ooh, do you want to be on telly?" <laughs> that, is, that is that is amazing. <laughs> that is TV gold because that is a disgrace. <laughs> it's it's like, like a badger that's been hit with a shotgun. My God. <laughs> Can I just say that uh, when? I was doing my show, Friday Night Dinner. Uh, the show before that was Embarrassing Bodies, right? So it was my first time on telly, and I was really excited, and I get all my friends to gather around and watch it, and if they tuned in ten minutes early, they were looking at someone's septic bellend. It's like, <laughs> my grandma ringing up, going, Tom, is that you? No, grandma, it's not. <laughs> ten minutes. Like... <laughs> I know you said you'd be on telly. What is the mal with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I've kind of been blessed as well with the guests today, because uh, Lorraine Kelly as well. Don't know whether you know this at all, um, but we kind of lived in the same village for, like, 16 years. Uh, do you know my parents? You know Chrissy and Jim Rosenthal? Do you know them at uh -huh. all? Yeah, they're my mum and dad. Are you the only boy? Oh, that's yeah. so sweet. So, like, are we I had cheese and wine boy? <laughs> <laughs> But saying. when I look at you now, you do look like your daddy. Is that? Oh, I've got a story as well. Um, my mum told me this. <laughs> My mum told me this story um, that my dad is like, as you can testify, like a semi-celebrity in his own right. He's totally. like a sports presenter. Um, and they were opening the new post office, Sam and Rhonda's. Sam and Rhonda's? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> you know <laughs> Sam and Rhonda! <laughs> the post office! So, so, I don't know, hear anyone and, the list. Uh, uh, so, so, on the internet. No, <laughs> Jim Rosenthal was booked in to open the post office, basically, Same. until Lorraine Kelly became available. Um, so my dad got shafted, sat in the living room going, what has Lorraine Kelly got that I do not? I imagine he'll recover now, watching his own son on TV, going, my dad's a semi-celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. Oh, that's really... Isn't he gorgeous? He's really sweet. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's a pretty boy. Yes, you are. <laughs> OK, so most people would rather diagnose themselves on the internet than visit a doctor. I like to, um, ask a few people. <laughs> if you get, like, best of five, you know, if three people think you should go to the doctors out of five, then you go to the doctors and you, get, you just lob it out, get a few people to have a look. Lob it out? Yeah. <laughs> and then, so, you know... Yeah, show a few people first. Because you must get annoyed with people going to the doctors that have got nothing as well. You must get annoyed by people just turning up and going, have a look at this. Do you think people turn up and just show up? <laughs> Have you got the feeling that anyone's just shown up and gone, have a look at this? <laughs> yeah. That is a corker, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't see many like that, do you? That is perfect. Do you want to take a picture? It's happened to a colleague of mine. Yeah. I was, she had to do an examination on a chap when she was a student and um, thought you had to examine the willy when it was hard, not floppy. So it was sort of best said to this man. I don't know who told her it. Oh, I think someone had wound Whoever her up Whoever did, should get a special prize. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to examine you here. <laughs> But basically did just that. <gasps> what? I think about I just have to wake him up. <laughs> and it was an elderly gentleman who was examined. Who couldn't believe his <laughs> luck. <laughs> Except that it took an awful long time to get there. <laughs> I think another one of us students possibly had told her that this was the way you examine it. <laughs> <laughs> and did she, um... <laughs> OK, so most people would rather diagnose themselves on the internet than visit a Dr. True or false. What do you think? True. Definitely true. If the man says true, we go true. Yeah, OK, what do you think? I, I think don't true. know. I think I'd rather see a person. It's like, you know, when you go into supermarkets and they want you to go in that machine with your shopping? I hate that. I like to see a person. I've actually stood in the supermarket and said, can I please see a person? Cos I can't get it to work. Oh, she's saying person. <laughs> <laughs> person. Right, well, 
but we'll I go don't we'll know. go false then. I don't know. Go false, okay. So I can tell you the answer is false. Well yeah. Sixty six percent of people would rather visit a doctor. <laughs> if I get diagnosed on the internet, I always make sure I get a second opinion. From CFAX. <laughs> And the winner is, is the name of our final round. Here is your question. Best way to patronise someone? Is it to ask them if they know what patronise means? <laughs> I always find the words, hey guys, do the trick. <laughs> especially, especially on a note. You're leaving a note out. Just wanna, hey guys. <laughs> Think it's best we wash our own mugs? After... <laughs> I don't know that you've written. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> so now I've written several times because people never learn. <laughs> Tried physical violence and they move out. <laughs> you see anyone moving around with four little dots on their head? They've had what I call the fork lesson. <laughs> Best way to patronise someone. What do you think? Because <laughs> people often think doctors are a little bit patronising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in restaurants, they're mm. sommeliers, and they're, they are... They, it's, part of their job is to be patronising. Going, well, I think I can recommend, probably, you might choose or be in your price bracket. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> this wine, sir. <laughs> Whenever they do that, I always do the same thing. After they've, they've said, I recommend this wine, I go, thank you very much. And then I go, go on, run along. <laughs> can I ask what a sommelier is? Because they don't have them in Nando's. <laughs> A Somalian. I thought you said Somalian at first. Yeah. <laughs> I just have pop and that, so that's why that hasn't come up. Pop. Pop. You don't have a pop at Pop Melier. Pop Melier. <laughs> no. Can I suggest the uh, Seven Up with the uh, <laughs> I love that. I love the family seven. bucket? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So best way to patronise someone. I'll give you a clue. It suggests they're stupid. Talk slowly to them. Talk slowly a second. It implies it? you know more than they do. I know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's much, it's much more on the nose right, rude. Okay. Go fuck yourself, eh, hole <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will tell you. The best way to patronise someone is to say, you wouldn't understand. Ah, OK. When you patronise someone, you talk down to them nicely, whereas condescension can be quite rude. You got that, fuckwits? <laughs> Well, that sound tells me it's the end of the round and the end of the show, which means the final scores are two points for Sean Steam and two points for John Steam. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> Thanks to all our panellists, our wonderful studio audience, and to all of you for watching at home. If you want more, tune in to 8 out of 10 Cats Uncut on Saturday. That's it from us. Good night. You know, it'd be great is if you liked and subscribed. I'm so needy. I'm so sorry. Uh, and why not come and see me live? And uh, the tickets are available at sarahmillican.co.uk. Put the kettle on and settle in.